All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on the last day of um, IGF. Um, and thank you so much for making the time for a 9.30 a.m. Uh, workshop. Um, so you're here today for a tutorial on public policy essentials of data governance. Um, I think it's a bit of, um, it's ironic to have a tutorial on the fifth day of IGF when essentially I think 90% um, of the workshops here have been on data governance. So we might just call this a refresher session. So, uh, you know, we just repurpose it a little bit. Um, since um, I assume a lot of you are interested in the, to in the topic of data governance and uh, want to engage with this more, we thought what we could do, uh, because we've all been um, attending a lot of workshops and sessions and there's a certain amount of fatigue, we thought we could galvanize this room a little bit with some questions. So um, raise your hands. I have a few questions for you. Raise your hands based on what you agree with. And we're also happy to take some responses. Um, and then we could get into the session. Um, let me just introduce myself. I'm Deepti Bharathur from IT for Change. I'm a senior research associate, and I work on issues of platform economy, um, digital citizenship, etc. Very happy to be here, and I will introduce my panel in just a minute. Uh, but before we get started, um, so let me, I have a question for you guys. What is data? So we have a few options for you here. Um, so data is, for those of you who think data is me, as in data is you, an extension of yourself, raise your hands, please. Okay, one person, two persons, three persons, okay. Uh, for those of you who think data is like a Lego block, so you use it to build other stuff, raise your hands, please. You can, of course, raise your hands for more than one thing as well. So we have one, two, three, four, five, okay, not bad. Um, what is data? No idea, never quite. I think that might be a bit of a, a farcical question in this session, but no idea. Like, if you still are struggling after having attended probably the 75th workshop on data governance, if you're still struggling with that question, please raise your hands as well. We can figure out the answer together. I can't promise I have it, but like, you know. Okay. <laughs> One person. I, I, I will also raise my hand, I think. And those of you who think data is a resource, so social, political, economic, etc., please raise your hands. Okay. All right. So those were my questions. And uh, what we could do, uh, you know, just I'm not necessarily saying that this is something that's going to be very participation heavy, so please don't walk away based on this question and answer session. Uh, but you could keep these responses in the back of your mind as we go through the session today and maybe revisit some of your assumptions at the end of it. Or, you know, we hope it reinforces. Um, all right, so what do you think data governance is? Um, GDPR. How many people think that data governance is GDPR? Okay, we have one, two, three, four, six. Okay, not bad. Um, data governance, that is policies that will shape the global economy. Okay, we have a few, some hands as well. Everything. Who believes data governance is literally everything? I was at RightsCon uh, earlier this year, and uh, I think the hashtag was digital identity is everything. And that really made me pause and think. And I was like, I don't know if that's true. So I, I thought I'll, I'll try the same trick. So data governance is everything. OK. Oh, not many. OK, it's good. Good not to be techno-deterministic, I think. So all right. Um, then um, who owns data? So how many of you here believe that no one data cannot be owned, that there's no such thing as data ownership? Okay, one half hand. Okay, we seem to be speaking to a room of converts, I guess. So, uh, whoever produces it. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, whoever is the source of data generation. These may not necessarily be the same thing, so that's the reason why. Okay, so we have a few hands as well. Um, data is owned by whoever establishes con control over it. True. <laughs> 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 Short thing. All right. Now, um, another teaser. So, non personal data and personal data. This may not necessarily be a very relevant debate for this year, but it certainly was when people started talking about data governance. 
do a lot of people in the audience still believe there's a very significant difference between non-personal data and personal data? Okay. Good. All right. And last question for all of you. Um, raise your hands if you've seen any of these words in any of the workshops that you've attended over the past three, four days. Okay. Anything that I've missed? I think I've also been attending all the data governance workshops, so if there's anything that I've missed, please feel free to shout out something that is not here that you think should go up here, and then we could also think about that as well. Yes, please. IoT, maybe. IoT, yes, that's a good one. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, please. Neutrality. Neutrality, yes, that's a good one. Okay, yes. Can you say that again then? Metadata. Metadata, yes, very good. Thank you. So we're going to add those as well. So what I'd like you to do as we move on with our session today is keep some of these ideas and these concepts that you've probably become acquainted with, are already an expert in, barely just starting to understand the surface of, depending on where you're at at this uh, debate, as well when we go through this panel. And you can come back to it at the end of it and think about whether these terms mean the same thing that they did to you when we started off. So with that, and uh, we have a nice full enough room now, I'd like to open up the panel. Um, uh, we have some very fantastic speakers for you today. Uh, we have Jean F. Caral from the IO Foundation, uh, who will be taking us through the role of technical infrastructure and standards in making data governance more effective. So he will be speaking to us about, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you must have come across the, um, the idiom code is law, and I think that's something that he will be well placed to talk about in terms of what it is that actually makes data governance effective. Some of it is the policy side, but some of it is also hard-coded law and how do, how hard-coded code, sorry, and how we make that happen. Then we have Duncan McKinn from the New Economics Foundation, who will talk to us about the challenge of personalized advertising and online profiling, and what policy responses need to um, be made towards that in the context of data governance. We have uh, Mart Detzgeld, who is a researcher and consultant from Brazil, who consults for MSCs, uh, sorry, SMEs under the Governance Primer Consultancy, and he will talk about the ownership of data. And then we'll come back around to me, and um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about data governance from a Global South perspective, and uh, put forward an idea that my organization, IT for Change, has been working on for quite some time, which is that of community data. So with that, I'd like to uh, ask John to uh, go first. Um, panelists will have 12 to 15 minutes to state their points, and my friend Zai, who's in the audience, will be your timekeeper. So please just look to her. Thank you very much. Is this one working? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming at 9.30 in the morning last day. I think everyone is kind of tired at this point. OK. Um, <clears throat> going back to some of the questions that we've been having at, as a teaser at the very beginning, um, I would like to first discuss what is our understanding about, about data. And I would like to make a, a point that we have to start to understand that data is actually contextual. And that's one of the main elements of data itself that we seem to be neglecting most of the time in these conversations. What do I mean by that? No data is disconnected from anything. And data has the value that we collectively, as most of the time in a collective delusion, uh, agree to give it. Say, for instance, money. We all agree that money is valued because we all agree it has a value. And so does data. Data represents a specific set or a specific value or a specific something that we have measured. And we all agree what does it mean and what's the value of it. A bird doesn't care about data and a tree doesn't care about data. Therefore, data is never disconnected by the source where it's generated. It's always connected to this source entity. What is profiling? Ever thought about what profiling is? I guess that's a buzzword. Everyone knows what Facebook, Twitter, all the big companies are doing. Everyone is um, familiar with the term of profiling? Someone hasn't? Okay. Profiling is essentially trying to discover who you are by your interactions with services. And if you take the reference of data being connected to the source, you quickly realize that what they're doing is modeling you. 
that has some very powerful uh, effects when we try to consider what we want to do with data. Um, essentially, a profiling is the scanning of the black box that is your head. We try to uh, figure out what are physical features of yourself, what are specifically emotional buttons that you may have, so we know how to press them and trigger you into commercial responses or changing your political allegiance. And we also try to figure out who you interact with, so we can try to figure out also where your taste is, what could be you know, your networks, who you talk to, etc. That is profiling. And we use that to essentially try to figure out how to manipulate people and how to extract value out of it. Um, we really need to start understanding as soon as possible that data is not disconnected. There really is a model of everything that surrounds us. That everything comes from a source entity that we recreate a model out of it and then we exploit those models. And that has very, very deep um, influences when we try to, to discuss about how we're going to be doing data governance and how we're going to have data protection laws that are human rights centered because we are not paying attention to the sources. We are only paying attention to the relationships between the sources. Why is it not possible at the moment to enforce the typical um, data protection laws that we have? Well, we are essentially missing the big point of the infrastructure. Let's say, for instance, let's go back to the corporate uh, scenario. What we tend to have is, say, for instance, some of you have iPhones, right? You go to iTunes, you buy an album. Who thinks that you actually bought the album? If you go to iTunes or to Google Play to buy a music or some movie, who still believes that you are actually buying the product? You're basically buying a license. Yes. Okay, you're not buying the product anymore. You don't. You're not the owner of the product anymore. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What I'm talking about is service providers. How when it when it comes to digi to to, to digital assets. So, let's say for instance that you buy that, you install it in some of your devices, you share it with some of your friends. It's living there. Okay. And you happen to have bought a very indie album, and Apple re decides, oh, actually, I'm not making enough business with this. I'm just pulling it out from my catalog. The moment that they decide to do that, what happens? It disappears from your devices, right? It will also disappear from your friends' devices or whoever you had shared it with. Why? Because they have the infrastructure to enforce it. They close the loop. They have their advocacy slash policy slash business model. And they have the infrastructure to enforce it. And there's nothing you can do. Now let's turn the table for a minute and look at what happens when it comes to citizens' data. Governments, with their best will sometimes, try to enact data protection policies. And what are those policies telling you? GDPR, PDPA, Malaysia, where I live, etc. They basically tell you when they cover commercial transactional um, operations, they basically tell you that you can provide your data to a vendor for as long as you have a commercial relationship with them. And when you decide to stop that, you can ask them to delete your data. Well, that's licensing. The problem is, when I'm requesting them to delete the data, who in this room can give me the technical reassurance that the data is actually deleted? Nobody. Because we are not closing the loop. Governments are uh, issuing policies that are supposed to be protecting the data, but they are not implementing the infrastructure to make sure that's observed by design. And in return, what they are making is basically putting the, the burden of verification in our shoulders. So I have to be the one knowing if Facebook did it in my data or not. And I have to be the one suing them if I, if I um, discover they didn't. And I have to have the money to do it, and I have to find a lawyer to do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are basically missing the point on that. So why is it that we are not doing it right now? Well, we basically haven't had, historically speaking, we have had this, this ext extremely strange cognitive uh, dissonance between um, all the products that we are having and software, essentially. 
So we assume that if I'm giving a car or if I buy a car, the car has already gone through checks and balances to basically comply with all regulations, right? I can't go to a scrapyard, pick up some parts of a car, build it in my garage, and go on the street. Why can't I do that with software? Why can't I claim that my software is doing a specific thing and it doesn't go through any checks and balances? Good luck finding me later. After I extracted all the data that I wanted from people, make my money, if I'm being Costa Rica. There's also another problem, which is essentially the education void. Has anyone ever heard in this room of any syllabus on human rights and digital rights being applied on computer science academia? Despite the fact that there's been a lot of conversations on ethics, on, on programming, et cetera, et cetera, but at large, no one, right? So how are we expecting programmers, which are the people building this stuff, to have any, any inclining towards human rights or digital rights? They have no idea. They are not part of the conversation. We are not inviting them. And beyond that, if, for instance, I'm an architect, I have a very clear set of harms that I can do. I know that if the building collapses, I'm killing people. And there's very specific methods for remedy for that, et cetera, et cetera. And we got checks and balances to make sure that buildings are safe, right? Well, typically programmers have no idea where are the digital harms they can cause because we still haven't listed them. There hasn't been proper research of that. So how do we want to start having conversations where the technology is the one that we need to fix when the technologies are basically not part of the conversation, they're not even aware they have to be part of the conversation, and we are not inviting them to be part of the conversation. A very prototypical, politically incorrect of, uh, um, question of mine is asking in the room how many tech people are here. Yeah, look around. There was like throw, three, four hands. It's cool that we are talking about advocacy. Of course, that has to guide us. Not the implementation comes from tech people, not from the advocates. <coughs> so, quick conclusion, because I think I'm almost done here in terms of, uh, of time. First, let's please accept once and for all that data is not disconnected, data is us. That changes a lot the conversation. Second, we need to start looking into national cloud computing uh, infrastructures. Because if governments are building roads for us, they should also be building the infrastructure to protect our data. And we should definitely start realizing that programmers are the next generation of human rights defenders and start bringing them into the conversation as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, over to Duncan. Great, so thank you. Um, if you could bring up the other presentation. Oh, sorry. one sec. Oh. I'm just going to go do that. Great. Well, well, Deputy does that. Um, so, yeah, that was a great kind of introduction there from Jean. So I'm going to go into uh, quite some detail on kind of what I consider kind of the beating heart of the data infrastructure and thinking about how the incessant drive towards personalization uh, and the ads that they serve us um, and the profiles that these companies are building are in fact so central to the governance of data um, that unless we look to them in detail and address them, we're never going to really get a data governance framework that really works for people. Um, so I'm going to try and, uh, they're quite big topics, so I'm going to try and do them uh, within my 15 minutes, so let's see how we go. So first of all, on personalization and ad tech, just a quick bit on the technical stuff because not everybody always knows this. But when you visit a page, when you click on any web page on the internet, it does not come preloaded with adverts. In the time between you clicking on the web page and the web page loading, the web page builds a profile of you, sends it out to an auction uh, network where advertisers bid for the, your attention, uh, and then uh, the winners of those bids get to show you ads. And this all happens within 50 milliseconds of you clicking on that button. Um, and so this is happening billions and billions of time a day. Um, and so there's some real problems with this model of ad tech. Um, in fact, it's become one of the principal reasons why uh, the internet has turned into kind of a, some surveillance infrastructure, because people 
are desperate to gather every single click, every single page, every single thing you visit, not only in your online world, but also connecting it to things in your offline world to, as Jean said, build the most complete profiles of you possible. And that's something we'll look at in my second section. So delivering ads has become the central business model of most of the internet, at least the m many of the free services that we really rely on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so this bid request system, so this system whereby you visit a page, it sends out a profile of you. Um, we did a calculation for the, in the, just for the UK, so the UK has 60 million people. Um, this is happening at a rate of 10 billion times a day. This data is being transferred uh, in a way, uh, so this, and these 10 billion bid requests are going to thousands of advertisers. Um, and so this is a huge um, um, personal data flow that is going from uh, the profilers who have us into the advertising industry. Uh, and, it's, and it's hugely worrying. And this is in a market that's hugely concentrated. So almost 90% of the digital ad revenue is spent with just two companies. So those are Google uh, and Facebook. So it's an extremely concentrated market. It's a market where our personal data is being shared uh, very, very regularly. If you extrapolate that number to the world, you're talking, it's happening trillions of times a day. And this is not just uh, data that you would be happy to share. Within those data packets can be issues around your mental health, your political uh, affiliation, uh, your sexuality, your gender, some things that can be really uh, damaging uh, if they were uh, released. And there's also a real technical problem with ad tech. It's a huge subject of fraud. Uh, you have whole bots uh, just clicking on ads. You even have uh, a, you know, huge cycles, so a huge amount of money is wasted. Uh, and an incredible statistic is that 56% of those adverts that people have paid to paste on the websites that you visit don't even ever get seen by a human. So it's a huge waste of resources as well. And in fact, the marketing industry is facing a lot of backlash now for kind of inflating their figures and inflating the real uh, benefit of it. And we're starting to see now the backlash from the European information commissioners. Uh, so a French data broker recently was uh, fined for using this ad tech stream. So the stream of data that was being provided to basically scrape data on almost 50 million people uh, across the EU. And this was from a tiny data broker that nobody had ever heard of. Um, and we've been working very closely in the UK with a number of other organizations with our information commissioner. Um, and she ruled earlier in the year, basically, that ad tech contravened GDPR. But because it's so central to the functioning of the internet, she wasn't actually able to move forward and actually ban it. And so they are now working with the advertising industry to try and find a compliant solution. But this is a really uh, key thing that we're going to have to address. And indeed, I was even at a talk from a, uh, an FT columnist who was also in agreement that uh, ultimately we're going to need to deal with this problem of ad tech, and it is just not uh, compliant. And so what we propose at the New Economics Foundation is to have privacy respecting advertising. So we don't think that advertising should be taken out of the internet. It's a valid business model uh, that, has, uh, that predates the internet in terms of media and so on. But what we reject is the kind of the personal nature of it. We think that you can, and uh, what's exciting is that companies are now proving that this is true. So many US companies with the advent uh, in the implementation of GDPR um, themselves decided that the ad tech process contravened GDPR uh, and uh, placed their ads in a kind of contextual way for pages in Europe uh, and in fact generate more revenue than uh, going through the ad tech model. The Financial Times also recently has changed their model, again moving away from the ad tech bid request system into a more contextual advertising. So, we think that there's some real potential here. It would absolutely change the dynamic of the surveillance of the internet um, and, uh, and would have really some really positive uh, 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 ramifications. So it would start to tackle these data leaks. Um, um, it's important to remember that Cambridge Analytica was one of the other companies that had access to this ad stream uh, in the past. Uh, it would reduce the commodification of data, so data could once again go back to having its more kind of public good or at least an, uh, and represent us. Um, it would force the tech giants to diversify their model. 
Uh, the Googles and the Facebooks would no longer be able to rely on this. Um, and it, more importantly, it would distribute some power back to the websites who have been, uh, uh, who've had their power taken away uh, by this over-centralized uh, kind of ad tech model. And you can see that for the New York Times or for the Financial Times, places like this already starting to do it. Um, and it was an opportunity just to fight back against ad fraud and criminality. So with really simple tweaks, we think this would, this would be a really fundamental change of the internet fundamental change of the way where you think about data and the way that data is currently used and monetized. Um, so in the remaining uh, second half, I'm going to deal with the, the flip side of this ad tech world. So how do we, and, and building off what Jean said about how we build profiles of ourselves. So um, these profiles are being built everywhere. So there are currently thousands of profiles, thousands of Duncan McCann's online, uh, sitting in various states of completeness, some maybe just one or two data points, a time when my phone hit a Wi-Fi mast and somebody got gathered by a network. Um, other profiles will be thousands of data points deep, um, and we'll look at some of those uh, in a minute. Um, and these profiles are not just important for ad tech, although that's definitely one of their core drivers. Um, but also as algorithms take on an increasingly large role in our lives, and this is everything from deciding uh, whether you should get a job interview, uh, whether you should go to prison if you uh, are before a judge, um, and even where I live in London now, so in the borough of Hackney, um, if you have a child uh, now in Hackney, your child and your surrounding um, ecosystem, so it would be parents, grandparents, things like that, are run through an algorithm to try and predict the likelihood that that child will be subject to child abuse in the future. And if that algorithm comes out with a positive, social services are all over you, checking you, making sure that you're, uh, nothing bad happens. So these profiles are, are moving from something that helped us decide the order in which our search results were seen, the way our friend requests were posted, or what recommendations we see on Amazon, um, all things which have limited kind of social impact, although it's important to note that they do still have important economic impact, potentially, how we see the, uh, these results. But they're moving into things which are really, really important for us as people. Um, and so it's really important that if uh, these algorithms are making vital decisions about us, that they are actually making decisions about us. And this is where we could go a little bit into what Jean was talking about, about these models that people are building about us. But if we think about when an algorithm makes a judgment about us, and that happens, it's gonna happen more and more regularly, there are really three ways in which we could be wronged by that judgment. First of all, the algorithm could be designed badly. Uh, it could have in it that one plus one equals three, uh, and it would obviously come out with an incorrect uh, decision. Uh, the algorithm could use protected characteristics. It could use things that it's not allowed to use to make its decision. Uh, and we've seen some examples of that in the US with um, housing adverts not being placed, uh, not being placed in front of people of color, um, things like that. Um, so it, it could use race or sex as, a, as an opportunity to discriminate or a proxy, which obviously algorithms are very good at discovering proxies. So often for race, it can use address and postcode, um, things like that. But the third way that we could be damaged is if the algorithm is in fact using incorrect data about us. It's not actually assessing us, but it's assessing an incorrect model of us. And so how do these people build up these models? So these are just um, some interesting examples. So two of the biggest profilers of us in the world are Oracle and Axiom. So Oracle has about three billion profiles of us. So that is almost half the people in the world uh, Oracle has a sellable profile on. And you can see that it is not just the stuff we would uh, automatically expect uh, to have. So really our online data, but they are absolutely matching this with offline data. Um, and they claim to have upwards of 30,000 attributes <laughs> on each of those two billion people. It's, it's, it's quite unimaginable. Um, and then Axiom are the same, so they're a 
another company, again, big on data profiles. And again, they assemble all these different bits of information into profiles of you. Um, I would encourage everybody uh, to go to these websites and do a subject access request. So you can go to them and you can find out what they know about you. It's a fascinating, if scary, exercise. Um, I've had a number of them sent to me. They tend to be about 60, 70 pages long, printed out. Uh, and it's really incredible what they know about you. But what's almost more incredible what they know about you is what they get wrong. Um, and places like Axiom, so these are, this is one of the industry leaders, um, they state publicly that about 30% of the information that they have about you is wrong. Um, and yet, these are the profiles that are making very, very, very important decisions about us. And as we move forward into the future, are going to be making even more important decisions about us. Um, uh, and, and obviously, what they do is not just take data points, but they also do is they make inferences about us. So they use what they know about us to try and find out more about us, to try and infer interests, uh, propensities, um, especially around consumption, because that's obviously where our profiles can be most easily monetized. Um, and so what should we do about this? So um, it's not always easy to think because, it, and again, from an organization like mine, so we're a progressive organization, when we see market failure like this, and this is something that I would really term market failure, there shouldn't be thousands of me out there, uh, most of it with incorrect data, making vitally important decisions about me. Um, often our response would be, as it is in the UK now where our railways are failing, our um, postal service is failing, uh, those make sense to bring back into state control. Um, it's not such an easy decision when thinking about something as important as our data profiles. Um, and indeed, when I go out and talk to people in the UK, but also further afield, there's a big reluctance to have uh, this kind of resource at the fingers of the state. Um, and that's something we've really got to be uh, mindful of. This is my last slide. Um, um, and so what we've recommended and uh, are trying to work uh, towards establishing the kind of a more specific technical uh, understanding of as well is that the government should fund an independent and decentralized digital identity system. Um, and so this should, one, allow us to prove our identity online without giving up uh, personal data about us. So in the UK, we had a big conversation about online porn and how we verify that people are 18. The only solution that we had was, okay, well, you've got to provide your credit card details. Uh, this is a very uh, um, suboptimal um, solution. Much better to that it, it, our new digital identity system could provide a cryptographic key that proved that I was over 18 without having to tell them that I was Duncan or that I lived in the UK or that my email address is duncan.mccann at x.b. Um, the second thing is, is that then it would provide a cooperative digital identity system that we build and have, an, have, a, have agency over, rather than these systems built by other companies which are built kind of in opposition to us without us knowing. Um, so that we would build up a digital identity online uh, through easy to use apps and websites. Uh, we'd have direct control over that data, uh, decide what verified attributes we wanted to include, what inferences are okay for our profiles, um, and then an independent organization, this independent organization would then stipulate how uh, companies, but also government agencies and municipalities can tap into that identity system when they need to understand our identity. Um, uh, and so we think that this would be a much better way forward for digital identity in the future, which is going to become such an important component of our online world. And really, we should be in charge of it and not oracles and the axioms uh, of this world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I hope all of you are suitably scared, as I am. Um, over to Mark now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Mark speaking. Um, this is a tough act to follow. Very interesting presentations from my colleagues. Thank you. But uh, I guess I'm lucky uh, because I want to speak somewhere in between both of these positions because I'm originally a coder, but now a, a policymaker. So at some point, those have to intersect, even though it's harder than you might think. 
Um, I worked a lot with metadata, but not metadata in the sense that we think about profiling people. I've worked a lot with metadata for websites. And what that does on websites is it structures the website. It gives them points for us to understand them. And it's all very compartmentalized. So you say this is the page title, this is the date it was published, things like that. And when I think about this, it's a, con it's a choice that is being made for data to be more structured in the world, for it to be easier to be portable, for it to make more sense across different platforms and across different search engines, for example. Here we are talking about websites. Where do I want to go with this? Why isn't our personal data treated in the same manner? I could say because it's impossible. From a coding perspective right now, it is impossible. Each provider, collector, each aggregator of data right now, really, they aggregate your data in whatever way they want. That's true. They really do. But is that impossible? to do it differently? Couldn't or the data be collected in a very specific manner that makes it portable? And therefore, if you get tired of a platform, you can bring it to another platform, for example. Instead of having to throw away all your friends on a certain social network, all your photos, all your, uh, all your postings, Letting go of a platform right now means letting go of your history in that platform because it's platform exclusive. And that makes a very tough choice to go away from a certain big platform of social media in case, you know, you're a little tired of them or their privacy policies change. That could happen, yes? So what I want to bring to our attention is this is very possible. Our data could be our own. We could fine-tune what we want platforms to see. We could fine-tune what we want to bring forward, what we want to be deleted. This is just a choice that is being made for it to not be that way. From a coding perspective, there's absolutely nothing stopping things from be working in this way. And there's a website called schema.org which is where these structures for web pages and for all different, different things exist. If you drop by, you see there's even you know, categories for insects and all sorts of very interesting things. Why isn't our data being treated in that way? Right? And the reason is very simple. There is no incentive for these platforms to do it this way. There's absolutely no one pushing for this. They are not going to do it themselves. Think about it from a private sector perspective. Why would you make it easy for your customer to go away? What is the, what is the business model there? Well, uh, here, I'll waste years changing my data collection practices, changing my database structure to make it easy for my customer to go somewhere else, take their business. Makes absolutely zero sense from my perspective. Right, so that must mean the push has to come from somewhere. They have to be compelled to do this or they won't. It doesn't make sense for them, which is where the policy making comes in, right? And this is why I want to establish a dialogue with what is being said here with both John and Duncan that yes, the coding has to be a very very serious consideration and the policy has to be a very serious consideration because we can only make this kind of idea flourish or m make this sort of policy happen if we are coming from a point where we are looking to both the code and the policy. I have a lot of activist friends and I respect their work very much, it's very important, but very often talking to them, I, I perceive that they don't really get what's going on behind that. So what happens is that becomes very easy to maybe for the platforms to give them a, an answer that looks right, 
feels right, but from a coding perspective, it's just about the same. You can do a, you can lie a lot with code. You can lie all the way back and forth with code, right? You say, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. Yes, what you're doing is maybe something even more insidious. So to prove my point that, that it's possible, right? Uh, I'm not just saying something theoretical. This, there's this little point of data that I really like. It's from Privacy International. So 40% of the free apps on the Google Play Store transfer data to Facebook via the Facebook software development kits. Now, I want to give you one moment to consider this, okay? Data, portability, not even a, a consideration, right? Nobody's talking about this, very few people. And yet, these platforms that theoretically competing for your, for your ads, for your data, they exchange over 40% of the data that goes on in your mobile phone over a free app that charges for in-app in payments for a free mobile game. So it's very possible. If it, if it is in their interest, if it works for them, it's very possible. If it makes business sense for them, it is very possible. So there's nothing that stops this from being a reality, right? And at that point, are they even rivals or are they just working together to collect data, right? So how do I think we should start approaching this? And I think John's project is incredibly relevant in this sense. Um, not enough attention is being paid for what goes on beyond what is already available. And, and this deep dive into ads really tells us the things that we need to know. This is the kind of approach we need to start taking towards data, right? It's let's look very deeply into the code and if we can maybe have a look even deeper at the source of it because somebody happens to have, you know, found a way to get around to it, that's even better. It's the mechanism of the data flow. It's something that if activists and data, you know, people who want to engage with data from a civil society perspective need to do moving forward, I think we're a little past the point where we can just talk about this in a very broad manner. This needs to happen, right? And this, this does mean a lot of very, you know, boring stuff to look into, but it's kind of where we are because they keep finding new ways to innovate with your data. So to me, as we think about this moving forward, policymakers need to start to be engaged from both angles so that they really feel pressured. If they, apparently they are not reacting enough just from a policy perspective. They, 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 they find it very important, but the solution is GDPR, which as we know, creates a whole lot different set of problems and then creates reactionary laws all across the world. And just now people are thinking about data localization and data localization is maybe even worse than not having data localization, than, than, than the data being spread, at least your data is spread. Now it will be super localized and very concentrated in a specific server in a specific place. So things have unintended consequences. And when we start to think about this moving forward, that's my consideration. Data portability, actually owning our data in a structured way that we can move away if we are tired from a platform, if their privacy is not good for us. I will leave my intervention here and hope we can continue having a conversation. Thank you very much to everyone. All right, um, so that leaves me. Um, I have my slides back, please. Thank you. So we had, um, I think, some really great interventions, which um, I think have been very uh, effectively able to tie uh, sometimes the invisible threats between technology and policy. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, with my time today is um, go back to the basics a little bit and give you a little bit um, a different perspective on what uh, data governance challenges and questions can look like from a Global South perspective. So I'm just going to, sorry. So my, the, my, I'm starting with a primary assumption here, and I'm going to sort of develop my 
speaking points as we go along, that the concentration of data has been co um, the concentration of data has been coterminous with the concentration of wealth and power. And so, um, sorry, one sec. So when we talk about this, what do we mean? So there is an in, there's an indisputable concentration of power that's happened today that we see everywhere. And this is both in the hands of private players and dominant nation states. This is a trend we see across sectors. So whether that's energy, whether that's transportation, whether it's fintech, whether it's manufacturing, health, agriculture, what have you, ports and logistics. Um, ID for Change has done a lot of research in how economic sectors are being fundamentally reorganized uh, through data. The, if you track any of the major mergers and acquisitions of the past year, if you look at any amount of like VC funding, all of it is essentially premised on the, uh, the economic power of data. So that's something that we want to keep in mind. And when this happens, um, what essentially is happening is that weaker economic actors and communities are facing an increasingly insurmountable disadvantage in competing against data powers. So this is something that we see in the case of workers versus platforms. Um, we didn't have a lot of discussion about labor rights at the IGF this year, but this is something that's really picking up across the world where we have uh, gig workers, whether they're on food delivery platforms, whether they're on Uber and other kinds of ride sharing, ride hailing aggregator platforms, really come coming up and saying that um, there's an atomization of labor that's happening here. There's a dismantling of what is understood to be the traditional employment contract when you don't even treat people as employees. Uh, but, sin but still, they seem to be working longer and harder than everybody else. So that's like a, a real problem here. We have noticed in uh, developing nations especially, uh, small producers and traders versus e-commerce companies. So IT for Change has been working a lot with small trader groups, et cetera, who've find themselves at a very di at a very difficult stage right now where the advent of Amazon and the domestic unicorn in India, which is Flipkart, has really changed the rules of game. So you have like excessive deep discounting practices, you have like hyper-targeting of customers. All of this is again resting on the power of data. Uh, we see farmers, um, you know, who are being co-opted into an agro-business chain that's completely being re-engineered on the basis of data. So if you look at all the mergers and acquisitions that happened over the past two years, whether that's Bayer Monsanto, whether it's John Deere, which acquired Blue River Technology, which is Sea and Spray, which incidentally ended up destroying the very crops it was supposed to protect. And you can go look that up in a very interesting report that came out by ETC. So you have a lot of AI-led, data-led consolidation that's happening in very critical sectors, education, health, um, you know, agriculture, etc. And what we find is that, especially for actors in the global south, not only are they unaware sometimes of the co-option that's happening, but they are increasingly powerless in the face of it as well. And when we turn a little more to like startups and small firms, we find that most startups nowadays die or you know become quickly bought out for like, their data value proposition than ever before. They don't really stand a chance against transnational tech giants. Uh, and it's at a geopolitical level we find the developing nations are also increasingly finding themselves um, risking policy space, risking economic pathways when it comes to the data race. So uh, I just wanted to um, provoke you a little bit. Uh, this is not intended to be a diss against open data. So just uh, keeping that in mind, what I'm trying to suggest when we move towards the idea of ownership of data is that what we understand to be default open has become default privatized. And I'll get into why that is. Um, so. What then we find is this relentless race to the bottom where every actor in the global supply chain without a data advantage can be outcompeted, outbid, outperformed, and therefore squeezed, demoted, rejected, or worse, ejected from the global economy. And this scenario has happened in part due to a regulatory wild west of the digital, which has allowed for the accumulation and subsequent enclosure of data by private actors. This is data that was and is produced from and by people in social and financial transactions. It's collected through states and statistical survey methods. And more recently, it's being generated via nodes and IoT networks. It doesn't per se belong to private tech companies, and that's the assertion that I make here, but it has been captured in ways that grant a no questions asked carte blanche to them. 
but this doesn't have to be. Uh, in more recent times, what we've noticed, and uh, a lot of my panelists did speak about the issue of personal data, which has become important in the wake of Cambridge Analytica and other such uh, problems of misinformation, hyper-targeting, etc. Uh, there has begun to emerge some kind of rulemaking in this, in this very critical domain, but a lot of ambiguity remains, especially in the global south as states still struggle to rise up to these institutional challenges of developing and implementing data governance frameworks that can serve their goals and be in public own interest. Uh, there are lack of clear norms. Uh, there are institutional, real institutional capacity deficits. It's not, it's not, not everything is malicious or misguided or you know, it's not a question of negligence. Sometimes there are real institutional capacity deficits. And there is also, I think, a hyper-optimism which has unfortunately pervaded governance in the global south where, uh, with regard to techno-solutionism, which have played, all played a part in furthering what I call this private by default regime, where data is extracted from communities and nations with little, if any, thought to citizen safeguards and benefits sharing. Um, I'd like to give you an example of uh, why and how this happened. Uh, this is even like pre uh, you know, even before people started to talk about these very important issues, in 2017 in South Africa, the welfare system was severely compri uh, compromised as a result of the South Africa Social Security Agency, which is SASA, uh, entering into this very poorly framed contract with a private company to administer its welfare entitlements to citizens. This contractor was entrusted with the task of, uh, you know, basically identifying beneficiaries and doing direct cash transfers on different matters, whether it's welfare, pension, disability assistance, et etc et cetera. But this company was not only able to exploit this database uh, you know, to make unauthorized debit deductions because it had a sister telecom company and what it was able to do very successfully is like divert funds from the grants, uh, from the, the, the welfare entitlements to cell, uh, cell phone payments, uh, to different kinds of fintech loans, etc. But when this issue got brought up, and when SASA wanted to like exit from the contract after the time had expired, not only did the company say that uh, if you want us to continue working with you, we're going to raise the fees. And, I mean, they were doing a terrible job of what they were doing, but they were saying if you want, to, want us to continue doing this terrible job, not only are we going to raise the fees, but if you um, exit from the contract and if you don't give us and if you don't renew the contract we will walk away with the database because their assertion was that they had created the database and therefore they have all rights to it and that uh, is not necessarily true at all but because at that time there didn't exist a language of data protection for citizens there didn't exist like a due diligence and like these kinds of norms within public procurement etc you have the situation where a very critical service, which is of welfare, which makes a very big difference in a, in a nation like South Africa, you know, was literally on the cusp of like this extreme crisis. You know, but the courts intervened and they said that you know the beneficiaries' uh, data must be protected, and you know there was some work that was done. And this case is still being fought on many different. It has many different dimensions. So please go check it out. It's a classic case of like. This is exactly the kind of cautionary tale that shows us how quickly data without governance can be usurped and or be appropriated. And we've seen this kind of data extract, uh, extractivism a lot in developing nations, and scholar Lynette Taylor has called this a digital resource grab that may have implications as great as the original scramble amongst the colonial powers in the late 19th century. Um, so why do I then have this slide up here that talks about cross-border data flows? You might be wondering. I'm getting to that. So what? In, in the absence of rules, uh, in the past two years, there's been a concerted push for cross-border data flows and e-commerce by Global North actors within critical trade agreements. Uh, there was a session right here two days ago on the Osaka track. Um, there, there, a lot of you might have or would have, would have followed the news of the RCEP that you know sort of um, was passed recently. A lot of these um, trade agreements in pushing for cross-border data flows risk further shrinking an already small policy space for developing nations who are not only late to the party in terms of having a viable digital econ economic pathway, but they stand to lose even their traditional competitive advantage. Uh, for example, we know that 3D printing now will infiltrate manufacturing so much that garment, factor, uh, garment manufacturers in Vietnam and Bangladesh stand to be very, very afraid of the fact that um, you know, their 
entire competitive advantage can just be taken away from them. So but they, 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 they stand to lose uh, the competitive advantages. And um, it's not necessarily the point that cross-border data flows is a yay or a nay question. That's not the assertion that I'm making here. But the idea that when we insist on these in international trade agreements, what we do is foreclose possibilities for nations to arrive at these decisions in ways that serve their best interest. So not only is the present at stake, but it's also the future. Because countries that sign away rights uh, in this manner will also be signing away rights to chart effective AI strategies, national strategies for data, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I already said this before, so I won't get into a lot, but uh, a lot of my panelists did focus on the issue of personal data. It's also very important to notice that uh, while a lot of policy focus has gone into personal data protection, which is a very important vital issue, aggregate non-personal data is just as important for digital econ economy corporations. A lot of the data that is produced, for example, um, let's say, um, you know, survey data about like land mass in a particular country, or climate patterns, soil data, etc. These are not necessarily personal data, but they are often produced by communities. They're often like uh, produced through processes of communities, etc. And it's very important to look at these as well when we think about what is an effective data governance framework for um, developing nations. Lastly, uh, you know, before I present my grand solution, I want to just also make the point that voluntary data sharing, and I'm sure a lot of you might have gone to workshops that would have pointed this out, never almost works. Uh, there is no such thing as voluntary data sharing. Um, there is, uh, in terms of like actually articulating a public interest uh, data framework, it cannot be on the benevolence of capitalism. And that's something that we really need to recognize when we think about data governance frameworks as well. Uh, we need to think about how best to um, ensure that data governance can be in public interest. So what should be the starting point of data governance then? Uh, in terms of hitting at all of these issues that I mentioned, the problem of uh, you know data, like an absence of rules and norms that we are currently struggling with, the threat of foreclosure of data policy space, uh, this kind of like improper contracting, et cetera, that could happen. And the problem of like governing the non-personal just as importantly as one governs the personal data. Personal data is something a lot of developing nations have been working on. So that's, I think, something that time can take care of, but this is something that's of utmost urgency. And here's where um, I want to say community data. So what is community data? Community data is essentially aggregate data. Um, sorry, one sec. Yeah, community data is aggregate, de-identified personal data that's generated from a geographical or an interest-based community or natural phenomenon and artifacts generally associated with the community. So like I said, um, where small-scale farmers in India have particular farming practices that they've developed over millennia, you know, germplasm, particular ways of like uh, seed sharing, etc. That's data that's generated by a community. It should belong to them. It should not become enclosed in this like private by default regime by a, a Bayer or a Monsanto. And the only way that we can we can ensure that that we can have community data as a starting point, which in my view, and in the view of IT for Change, opens up the possibility to hit at all those other problems, is if we govern community as a, a community data as a collective resource, that we try and create the notion of a data commons that allows communities where data is produced, who are responsible for data, to not only have rights over it, unequivocal, uh, but to be able to innovate based on that, according to their needs, and also you know, share benefits equally. And I'll end here. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, so we could now open up the floor to questions and comments. Uh, we can collect about three. Um, I'd request uh, members of the audience to kindly indicate if you have a question to a specific speaker to sort of mention that as well. And if it's a comment, you could also mention that. Uh, yes, we have the lady at the back and then so, oh, hello. Lee Tut Hill with the WTO. I have two questions. Uh, both of them relate to concerns about competition. I think my first question is for Duncan. Um, 
from a competition point of view, I was interested with the uh, brief statement you made that switching from a bid a bid oriented ad model to a contextual ad model could lessen some of the dom dom effects of dominance of the bid model. I'm wondering how much do you see that effect of sort of loosening the grip of dominance and do you have any other good e examples? And the second question was for the gentleman in the middle here who mentioned um, portability of um, your data, like for example with Facebook. Again, I think that's a, it's a very relevant to trying to uh, reduce the dominance. And if you have, you don't really have to be an activist uh, to be concerned that customers can move. I mean, in the telecom sector, it became a no-brainer uh, that you, there's a competition imbalance when customers can't move from one mobile operator to the other. So just about every country in the world now it has or either is having number portability. Is there a way to make an analogy to as a persuasive case to competition authorities that this data portability is pretty much synonymous with number portability because it keeps people from being able to choose the provider they want to choose? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, the gentleman there. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, there's also mics uh, at the end of rows, so you could just come up and... Um... <coughs> Thank you for the presentations. I have two questions. My name is Raymond Noah. I'm a research consultant with uh, regional think tank uh, for the Global South and IT Policy Research ICT Africa that is based in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, the first one is to Mr. Duncan. You talked about um, <coughs> the importance of uh, setting up independent digital identity system uh, curation or some, or some SAP, uh, but you mentioned government as your proposed funding agency. How, how then uh, is it possible to ensure the independence of that kind of institutional structure for uh, a data architecture in that set? And then to uh, the lady, sorry, I didn't get your name. Uh, you proposed the identified community data as your grand solution. I want to know how how it is possible to manage the risk of re-identification based on ML algorithms and the like. Thank you. Um, okay, we can take one more and then we can um, turn to the panel. Yes, sir, please. The back. So, uh, my name is Ken. I'm also from the WTO. I have one question for Jean. Um, you mentioned this um, aspect of including human rights into engineers' uh, academia curriculum. Uh, is it something related to privacy by design that we have in the GDPR? If, if it's so, can you clarify or make the link? Uh, the question for all of you, it's about um, anonymization and encryption technologies. No one has mentioned that. Can you give your thoughts about this? And the third one is for um, I forgot who said that, but it was something about data localization requirements and, and privacy, the fact that we, if we concentrate data into one place with data localization requirements, that the exposure to privacy risk or yeah, to data breach, for example, uh, will be higher. Can you please come back to this point? Thank you so much. Okay, um, so maybe we can start with Jean and then move across the table. Yeah, um, so when it comes to the, to the question that you just made about uh, whether the education would be only about privacy by design, that's just only one piece of it. Um, how many engineers have ever heard about the UDHR? Very little. How many of them, um, how many out of those who have heard about it actually have read it? And how, which percentage of those have ever gone through an exam to actually prove that they understood what the hell it means? Uh, very little of them. 
So when you really want to try to have conversations where you expect them to have a certain penchant towards respecting human rights and they don't even know what it is, it's going to be uh, very, very complicated. And there's also, this might be a bit tangential, but there's also a little bit of um, what I believe it's, it's a misunderstanding about uh, um, agnostic technology. So what a lot of engineers will tell you is that they want to build technology that is absolutely agnostic. By that, they mean to say that they don't want to do stuff that will change direction according to the wind blowing in a specific cabinet, which is fair enough. I mean, we don't want any, pol any uh, technology that is specifically politically oriented because of the Pandora's box that it is. What, they, what I feel they, they fail to, to realize is that in their decision-making process when it comes to design technology, they're already making stands. And I'm going to give you a very simple uh, example, encryption. Back in the days, because of long story uh, to explain, encryption was not one of the core elements that we have, for instance, in communication protocols. And what we realized that it was actually a very bad idea. We started presenting that as, uh, so let, let, me, let me put a bit of context. Back in the days, we started having protocols without encryption. And then one day we realized, hey, maybe actually encryption is a good idea because we are sending um, plain text in our communications that can be intercepted, it can be weaponized against people. And we realized, well, yeah, not a good stuff. But then what we started doing is to pass the ball to service providers, AKA I'm hoping Gmail is encrypting my emails. But we didn't have any reassurance on that because it was left to devices of the service provider whether they wanted to decide on encrypting information or not. And that's when they realized, well, actually that wasn't a good decision either. We should actually move down the stack in the communications part, the encryption itself. So any service that I'm using, by default, is gonna be using encryption. And there's not a single proposal of any com uh, communications protocol nowadays that doesn't have as a core feature encryption. I'm sorry, that was us taking a stand. You may not want to see it as political, it was still a stand. So technologies do have to make these kind of decisions and as soon as possible. They can't remove themselves from, the, from that um, equation. Does that answer the, the question? This is, hello, this is Mark Dettesgaard speaking for the record. So I will react to two questions. First about the portability and how it relates to telecom and number portability for mobile devices, for example. And I think this brings me back to a problem that I have, which is the mystification of code and how I feel that to some degree it's intentional. I don't mean in a necessarily evil way, but it is sort of intentional. Code is seen as this very complex thing, and it's interesting that it's kept that way. It protects the, the coding market, right, if it is very difficult. But it's not that difficult. At least the premises of coding are pretty simple, and I do believe they should be taught in basic education because yeah, it's very easy to think of a phone number because we've internalized that in our day to day. The, this idea of how the world is made up of these machines and, and, and the code underneath them is something that we haven't been thinking about for that much of a long time. And it's exactly the reason why we should be approaching coders and policymakers to make them understand it's not that difficult, it's not as magical as these companies would like to make people think, because that's where they get the, their leverage, is by saying this is so difficult, you couldn't understand. You can't study this. This is, we, we use na former NASA staff to do this. And sure, you do, it's still a code, it's still possible to study. So that's my point. I, I, if people would care enough and try to understand enough, yeah, it's a point that is easy to make. You can go and say, when they, do, they give those explanations, you can say, that's untrue. It's portable. I can prove you. You can do this, this, and this. So that would be my personal answer to that. And about the data localization issue and why I think it would, it's not ideal, um, here I'm speaking from my perspective, right, based on my intervention. Because here I'm thinking about the actor that is in control of the data. So data localization in a large way 
switches away from the private sector towards the government. And when I think about who I want to challenge, would I rather challenge a company or a state? I have a problem thinking that a state would be very interested in what I have to say. Because a company, at the end of the day, if we establish a standard in an international body and it becomes industry practice, they kind of have to follow it. It happened in browsers. If you remember, browsers used to be a wild west. Everybody was doing whatever they wanted. But once a, a firm standard was established, everybody had to converge to a certain direction through industry practice. States don't act that way. States do whatever they want. We, we have seen this again and again. They don't care. So is it better to still have it in the private sector? Yeah, I think so. Like We discuss a lot about this, about these companies holding our data, but they're still easier to tap into and force them to do things and compel them than states. But that's my personal take. I'm sure somebody else can make the opposite argument. Thank you for the questions. Um, yeah, so I'll just tackle the question on, you know, what kind of effect could kind of contextual advertising have on the kind of sector generally? Um, and I think it really would be substantial, um, especially for Google. Facebook's a slightly different beast because actually its ad model works slightly differently um, to what we've talked about. But um, Google at the moment, a lot of its ad revenue comes from owning the real-time bidding uh, soft um, kind of middle piece of the puzzle. Um, and so uh, any ad that's being placed now on the internet, Google is kind of getting a, a or, or there are two platforms, but um, the Google-owned one is the, is, 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 is the dominant one. Um, so Google would still be able to earn ads. And in fact, the most effective ads uh, in, the, in, in the kind of online space are the ads that appear next to your searches in a Google. And there's a really good reason for that. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what you're thinking about because you've just typed it into a search box. And so obviously, search terms related to what you've, ads related to the search term you just related for work well. And those are the best ads in terms of click-through rates on the internet. So Google would still have, in ad terms, the prime real estate. So it wouldn't decimate its revenue, but it would stop it basically taking a cut from everybody else's real estate. So as you go to the BBC News or to The Guardian or to you know, any other kind of publication, uh, Google is now taking a cut, and this would return it much more to kind of those uh, places. So, so I think it really would have a, a, a really strong uh, a kind of uh, effect in terms of the revenue around marketing. But again, I think for me, the, 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 the other effects around decommodifying data and reducing the need to collect it all are almost um, as important. And I certainly will let you come back in a second. Um, in terms of then the independence, I think this is really all about how you design it. So in the UK, we have a number of uh, kind of organizations working for the public, which are not government run. Um, the BBC is always a prime example of this. It's set up. It even receives its annual funding from the government, uh, but the government has no oversight in terms of how it runs uh, or setting the mandate uh, for the BBC. Um, so we could look at organizational structures like that um, as we go and set up. And really, all government does is sets up the funding and sets up the right framework uh, in which this has to operate. Um, and I'll just say a tiny bit about re-identification, because we had a quite robust debate about that in the UK, uh, and even got quite close to implementing a law uh, which would have made it illegal to re-identify people from de-identified data sources. Um, in the end, it fell because of questions of uh, legitimate investigations, what happens if the press receives a data set, re-identifies, identifies a crime. Uh, so it was being unable to kind of resolve these corner cases, which actually made the legislation fall. But I think ultimately, we need to think about something like that, which makes re-identification prohibited with some sort of public interest uh, exemption uh, around it. Um, so yes, I don't know if you want to come back quickly on the, on, on the point around concentration, and then on the tip tea. Maybe, maybe it's that I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by contextual advertising, because you just said that, OK, now you then go to FT. And so then Google used to get a cut of that. So under contextual advertising, it's now all FT's revenue? 
Yes. And Google's out of it. Yeah, so the way the FT and F the FT has actually switched its model uh, over time. Right. So it now does 70% of its advertising in the very traditional way that old school institutions used to do it. You say, hey, I've got 20 ad slots here and people bid directly to the FT to place directly their ads there, FT. not in a kind of one-off viewer Knowing frame. Knowing the customers, they want a readers of FT and that's all they Exactly, want. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of going back to the old school way, but using technology to deliver it rather than being in print and having a physical print version. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. You had a... you want to add? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to intervene that, uh, Duncan, you've yes. not really responded to the question on funding independence. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, yeah. I, th I thought I had. So, I think it's all about how you kind of set up the institution. So in the UK, we have a number of organizations that are publicly funded, have a public mission, but are absolutely independent of the government. And the prime example is the BBC. Um, and obviously the BBC has issues <laughs> outside of necessarily control uh, and the way the governance of the BBC is set up. I would, if it was up to me, I would change. But I think that what this demonstrates, and we have a number of organizations like this in the UK and around Europe, is that you can have a publicly funded organization with the broad remit of the organization set uh, by government together with civil society and, 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 uh, and the population, which then operates completely independent. So the government cannot tell the BBC what to put, it cannot censor the BBC, so, uh, nor does it have special access to the BBC. So uh, we need to think innovatively. So I don't think the BBC is necessarily the gold standard, but it's a, uh, an easy example that many people are familiar with of how these arrangements can, in fact, start to work. Okay, um, so just very quickly on the re-identification um, question. Um, it is a very important consideration, and I think uh, there are two, I mean, immediate solutions to that. One, uh, we need to establish no-go zones. Don't collect data that doesn't have to be collected, and that's something that I think needs to be very well thought out when we think about what should be in the ambit of community data. And of course, I didn't mention it, but I do want to say that it's not as if any idea of community data doesn't uh, proceed with the idea that citizen privacy and citizen safeguards are paramount. So um, I'm just going to leave it at that because we have a lot of people who probably want to ask questions. So yeah, please go ahead. And then Anupam, yeah. um, the lady at the back, and then Zaif. OK, I can start. Yeah. My name is Karl. I work for GIZ, that is German Development Corporation. Um, <laughs> and I mainly work on trade policy issues uh, at the moment. And, and of course, we think, and it has been proven in the past, trade can be very beneficial if it's done in the right way. Now, you mentioned, especially I think deeply, you mentioned um, a policy space, and that's also a consideration we are making. Uh, we also are convinced there needs to be regulatory space, while you also have to make some, some compromises. So now we have this whole new field of e-commerce, data governance, and I'm at least personally still struggling to get a clear idea what should be our recommendation to a developing country. What's, how should they use their policy space? What can they do domestically on all those issues you mentioned? It could also be data portability. I mean, our, my key interest would be e-commerce related things like competition. What do you do with the platforms in the situation you're in? You're limited. It's a very, um, so how should they use the policy space? And what are the trade-offs uh, in, in the policy space? Uh, what is to be kept at all costs? And what are the kind of compromises where you say there's something to gain that is acceptable? That would be very interesting for me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the lady and then Anupam. Hi, I'm Jennifer Boucher from R&W Media, an NGO that builds digital communities around the world, and we're based in the Netherlands. Um, I have a really simple question, actually, in a not-so-distant past life. I was, worked in public health, and what you did in HIV was, of course, do a lot of campaigning, edutainment, awareness raising. Do you, and this is a question for, for each of you, uh, or, or none, perhaps, I'm not sure. Um, do, you, do you know of any good projects being developed to raise public awareness? And, and I mean, really, the real public, right? Everybody who's out there, um, who's not necessarily involved in internet governance. 
um, just a really simple thing. I, I don't think that most people know how this all fits together. So we've all read a lot about Cambridge Analytica, and that created a lot of panic and anger, I think, um, which can be quite useful. But I don't know if people make the connection with the advertising, for example. And uh, yeah, are there any interesting projects coming up around that? Thanks. You had a question. Um, hello, Nupam Guha, faculty at IIT Bombay, Center for Policy Studies. Uh, specifically, two AI policy related questions. Um, I was hoping to hear more about that from this panel because you can't really talk about data without talking about the intelligence that is extracted from it. So, um, the thing with machine learning is that often you can sort of get away with things even if you claim that you are protecting data. For example, anonymization is something that could be subverted with enough machine learning power. Uh, consent is something that could be manufactured. Uh, you could basically get intelligence from, from what could be called community data and not personal data. So that is one thing that the one point for the panel to address. The second point is the question of standards which was ra raised by the panelists. Uh, the thing is uh, that from an AI perspective, um, most AI governance right now is, uh, happens through ethics councils basically. There, there is not really much of a regulatory space out there. And uh, there is really no proof uh, to show that these ethics council are in any way useful and not completely uh, not completely platitudes, and uh, more, more importantly, I would go as far as to say that they have been more of a harm rather th like if they had not existed because of their existence, um, companies, data monopolies have been able to get away with saying that we have done certain things, wherein the material consequences of doing those things haven't really changed the landscape at all and have contributed to A, function creep uh, happening at places where AI artifacts have been used in ways they were not intended to. B, there have been collusion between private and state actors wherein you have private players pushing certain AI technology, those being bought by the states because there was no regulation mandating what can and what cannot be done. And C, of course, anti-competitive practices and monopoly. So these two angles I, I would wish the panel to address. Thanks. Uh, do you, is the question directed at somebody in particular? The, okay. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to know, are there more people who'd like to ask questions? Um, if so, if you could raise your hands. Okay, so there's just one, so we can end with Zai and then uh, we could do the wrap up. That's why I just wanted to know. Please go ahead. Um, very quickly to Duncan, uh, do you think we need completely different economic analysis for browsing data and data that, that's not browsing data? Because with browsing data, it might well be true that it is actually a bubble and there's no reason for that large market to exist in the way that it does. But with other kinds of data, especially, for example, <coughs> um, mobility data, the monopoly might actually be so efficient that you need to think about different, uh, it may not be a bubble and you need to think about different interventions there. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, I'm Parminder from it for change uh, I think uh, we normally has now normally have now identified the problem, and and the seeking of the solutions either go completely in the private sector zone or in the government zone or somewhere in between. The question to Mark, who was saying that probably data port portability is the solution, uh, and that's more or less would uh, address the problem. I would raise this issue that Facebook has come with a very sophisticated document on very proper data portability. They seriously mean it. They've laid out the plan. Google and all are supporting it. Everything is perfect in that plan. I don't see anything amiss or anything evil as far as the data portability term and its meaning goes. Then you probably have to see why they are happy with that. And I suspect that they can deal with data portability as long as uh, the, they dominate the sector uh, and they know what kind of limited options individuals have and what they lose, and they're, they're ready to take that loss just to stave away public law. And whether it is really possible to keep on looking for solutions entirely in the private realm, not going to the public law, and then keep on figuring out every five years that we did not succeed, and then think something else, meanwhile the corporate power is entrenching. All right. 
Um, so again, I'd like to start from uh, Jean. So if we could keep responses brief, because uh, we are five minutes to closing time, and I'd like to also take like closing comments if possible. So please go ahead. Um, I don't think there was any specific uh, question. I think Anupam had a question on the AI thing. Uh, I will not have an answer on, on that particular okay, one. No problem. So Mark? Well, <laughs> the difficult questions. Thank you for them, uh, Mark. That is good for the record. I will briefly address the AI issue. Um, the, the reason why I think these ethical councils or these ethics councils are not useful is because they're political in nature. Again, uh, the, the, if you look at the choices, at least from my perspective, they're not people who are best suited to integrate them. They're the people who will look good or who will be good compromises or will look good for the for the for the for the for the board they're not being built around goals they're not driven towards success they're 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 political motivated and many of them have been failing right we see i think just this year three major um, ethics councils on ai have been dismantled one of them from a very big company that i won't name um, but th we are starting to see some form of deep self-regulation on that matter. And to this I'll bring uh, to the table the Deep Nude app, which was the, the app that intelligently undresses women. Well, there, it, that was considered so abhorrent that code repositories wouldn't carry it. It was sort of removed from the internet by the will of the people involved in, in, in AI-focused projects, they're like, this is not where we want to go. That is a form of self-regulation that we might start seeing more in the future as the field matures. This is one example I can think where this actually worked. So, and about the, the data portability plan, uh, it's a very good plan because it doesn't involve the community, it doesn't involve standards body, it doesn't involve the forum, it doesn't involve anything that would make people actually participate which is my, my question often is, why is there not the equivalent of an ICANN or an IGF for data? If there are so many researchers, so many activists, so many people involved, so, many, so much private sector, why not? Why are these decisions still being made within a very select circle? So they must be happy because otherwise the, the alternative to that would be for us to come together in a room with a bunch of experts and really dig down into that. And that's very undesirable, right? So sorry for the briefness. I would have more to say, but in the interest of time. For, for session. Um, yeah, so I'll just touch very quickly on trade policy. I've been looking into that quite a bit. Uh, and kind of the free trade agreements. And um, Whereas it started with a kind of um, slightly noble aim to kind of uh, enable e-commerce globally, I think it's straying into things like source code, uh, free uh, flow of data internationally, um, even things like authentication by, in effect, uh, taking away the power of states to kind of legislate and put in place controls around this. Um, I think is really worrying. And so for me, one of the first things, especially on those three areas, would really be to leave this policy space open for countries rather than try and fit it into a model uh, that at least on cursory analysis looks like it will benefit the dominant players rather than really enable kind of the development that we would like to see. Um, on raising public awareness, I think it's it's so important. I mean, I think I'm, you know, I think it's so easy when you you work in here and you can kind of see the impacts that you would automatically expect other people to be in the same place, um, and people really aren't. Um, but I think there has been a big change. So when we started talking about some of these things a year ago, it took a lot of effort to get people to where you were. Um, whereas now. Um, uh, one, there are more people seeing the dangers of this kind of rampant data extraction, profiling, um, and the advertising that goes along with it. Um, these big events, like elections, uh, always bring it up. So, for instance, one of the things that we're doing in the UK with, um, with the Open Rights Group is holding sessions all around the UK where... One, we're screening the film A Great Hack, which is well worth a watch about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, but then getting people to engage with the idea, especially around political targeting and political advertising. Um, and everybody there, we then help them access their data that political parties hold on us, 
because not only, so some of these profiles are being held in the UK by the Lib Labour Party, the Liberal Democrat, you know, they're all building individual profiles of us. We want to understand what uh, information they have so that we can try and build some kind of uh, awareness around it. But it is really hard because it's, it's ultimately technical. People don't really want to know. Um, it's also scary and so people don't, re and, and without a clear solution. And so it's, uh, it is a difficult place to uh, raise awareness. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely building up its own momentum and with outside events. Um, and then I think just in terms of what different kinds of data, so I think what's really important is that whereas our profiles and ad tech is built on a kind of foundation of browsing, um, as we'll have seen from the graphics about the profilers, it's absolutely not limited to that. They're connecting that to your digital set-top box, and so they're analyzing what you're viewing. Uh, they're linking it with your location data and where you go. They're linking it with other services that you buy. They're linking it with the apps, as um, you know, Mark, uh, as, you know, that so much of the apps is kind of transferring data automatically. So this is much more than that, uh, certainly from a personal perspective, but I would agree that there are, you know, there are other kinds of data that are important for different reasons that we must absolutely get out there. And I think cities uh, and especially the platforms that operate in cities, um, this is absolutely data that should be made available to the cities. And so totally, uh, you know, understand that kind of community aspect of data. Um, and, you know, places like Barcelona are taking those first steps where uh, now Uber has to hand over some of their data. Um, uh, but no, sorry, Airbnb has to hand over some of their data. And other cities are doing that same negotiation with data uh, with, with some of the other platforms. So I think it's really important. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm going to very quickly just respond to the trade question because we're actually over time. Um, so in terms of how to use the policy space, um, I think there are two, three... Um, I think it entirely depends on where a particular nation is in the digital, in the digital global value chain. Uh, for example, you said that nations find it limiting. India doesn't find it very so very limiting because of many different factors. We do have a strong ITES sector. We have a large population of like tech workers, software engineers. We also have a market power of 600 million users, which makes it uh, comparatively more easy for us to take certain steps in the policy space of trade. That's not necessarily true for other nations. Uh, recognizing that, I think there are two, three things. One is, um, I think we need to create policies at the national level and even more so at the local level so that uh, we're not foreclosed at the international level. So thinking about these issues at both these levels is very, very important. And I just want to... Um, Echo something that a uh, you know an associate of uh, as you know an activist who's been working in the the issue of like agricultural consolidation has been saying for a long time that we keep talking about the fourth industrial revolution and one thing that we must remember is that a lot of countries in the global south haven't even gone through the first so there's a big leap here about like AI and automation and all of these things and how we'll use data etc where you still have large populations unconnected you know not comprehending but very much co-opted into the global data regime. So till we get there, I think maybe it's also good for nations which uh, are not really yet there to even stay out of these kinds of trade agreements and strengthen digital capacity building before even getting into those spaces. Um, I'd urge you to look at the Digital Justice Manifesto of the JustNet Coalition. <coughs> We've just brought out a document which was released at the IGF, uh, which looks at some of these issues uh, and you know it has a set of principles. Uh, and I'm sorry, we are out of time and we are actually over time. So I want to thank all our panelists for coming here on the last day of IGF. Um, I don't want to go back to the slides, but I hope we were able to make you revisit or reaffirm some of the ideas uh, about data governance. So thank you so much and thank you to my wonderful panelists.